Okay. Um, now the uh, title or the subtitle of our book was Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength. Um, now people say a lot of things to sell books, but my background's as a scientist and we're not supposed to say things we can't make a good case for. So is it plausible, are there data that would suggest self-control really is that important, that central uh, to uh, human life and happiness? And I think, uh, yes, the answer is, uh, is very positive here. Uh, more data coming out all the time showing that people who have good self-control are more successful in school when they're young and in their work when they're uh, older and grown up and make more money. Uh, become more uh, prominent and successful. Uh, they're also better at relationships. They're more popular with other people. They, people trust them more. They have stronger marriages and intimate romantic relationships and so on. Uh, they are happier. They have lower stress. I mean, after all, one of the best ways to reduce stress in your life is to stop screwing up. Uh, <laughs> so if people with, low self, with good self-control can do that, it'll uh, make life easier for them. They're better adjusted, uh, fewer drinking problems and drugs and eating disorders and stuff like that. And uh, overall, better mental health, better physical health too. Uh, they behave better, uh, commit fewer crimes, less likely to be arrested, fewer traffic accidents, uh, partner abuse, uh, prejudice, everything like that. And at the far end of life, uh, they live longer. Um, and you know, by way of contrast, I started my career uh, studying self-esteem. I spent a long time with that, and uh, those of you who here this morning heard uh, Gene Twenge tell you uh, uh, some of the, the, the failures and pitfalls of uh, self-esteem and just thinking you're great. We had hoped that self-esteem was going to provide a lot of these benefits, but self-esteem was kind of a flop. Self-control seems to be the real deal and really does uh, make life better. Now, what is it? Uh, by self-control, it's, it's a way of changing yourself. Uh, I think you know, psychology thinks of behavior in terms of a stimulus and a response, uh, and so uh, it's a way of changing the response. You, know, you don't have to do the first response or the first impulse uh, that you can do. You can change uh, something about yourself and change your thoughts, change your emotions, uh, resist impulses uh, to do the wrong thing, uh, improve your performance. Um, uh, in the scientific literature, they often use the term self-regulation, and I like the term regulation because uh, it implies change, but not just any change, it's change based on an idea of how it should be. And the government says to, uh, they're going to regulate how buildings are made or something. It makes uh, uh, rules, it doesn't say just do it differently, but uh, there have to be certain uh, standards for how a building should be made. It should have windows and bathrooms and all those things. Um, so, in the same way, self-regulation is changing yourself based on idea of how you should and should not be. It's vital for human social life. I mean, uh, we live in society with lots of rules. That's uh, part of what culture is. It works when most people follow most of the rules most of the time, uh, but they have to change their behavior uh, to follow the rules. Morality, doing the right thing, sometimes calls self-control the master virtue, uh, because uh, most other virtues depend on your being able to resist the temptation to do uh, sin and advice and so on, and do the right thing. Uh, even uh, free will uh, very much uh, starts with self-control, with the ability to change yourself based on how you uh, think you should act. Now, um, how often do they use it? Uh, well, we had this uh, experiment uh, that uh, we ran a couple years ago where we had um, a couple hundred people wear beepers uh, all day uh, just to find the path of their desire. Whenever the beeper went off at random points during the day, they're supposed to stop and say, when the beeper went off, were you having a desire? Did you want something? Uh, and if so, uh, what did you want? How much did you want it? Did you resist it? And did you end up doing it anyway? Uh, so we found all these things about it. Uh, and uh, sure enough, when people had a desire, um, there was a big difference as to whether they resisted it or not in terms of uh, whether they actually enacted the behavior. Uh, if they didn't resist it, it's not 100%. You, you want things that even when you don't resist the desire, uh, you may not be able to do it because it's raining or you don't have a gun or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, things beyond your control prevent you from uh, enacting the impulse. But uh, so it's 70%. But if you resist, again, that's also not down to 0%. Uh, Self-control is not perfect. I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise. Uh, but, uh, but there's a huge difference, 70% down to 17%. Uh, so people resisting their, uh, their desires very effectively, uh, and this is on a daily basis. This is things happening uh, quite a bit, uh, quite frequently every day 
Uh, so uh, indeed, we found people reported having a desire about half the time uh, that they were contacted. So yes, every day we are resisting desires, uh, you know, and it's not just you know some huge uh, powerful desire to. Uh, uh, commit some heroic or dastardly act or something like that, uh, but rather ordinary things like uh, resisting the urge to laugh at the wrong joke or not to laugh or uh, to you know, not go to the bathroom or uh, all these little things that you do, uh, they do involve controlling our behavior uh, and, and in many cases resisting impulses. So, as I said, we found about eight hours a day people are in a state of desire out of 16, about half the time we beeped them. Uh, among those, three to four hours, uh, a lot of them are resisted. So people are using self-control to resist desires quite a bit. Uh, and then there's a, a glorious or naughty half hour a day uh, when you give in and do something that you've been trying to resist and you go ahead and have the piece of cake or whatever. How are we doing with those chocolates? Uh, um, okay, a uh, key point in my re research is that your willpower is limited. It operates like a, uh, a strength or a, an energy source uh, that gets used up. Uh, we started to talk about these in, in, in lab terms as uh, ego depletion in the sense that the self consists of some energy that gets used up uh, when, you, uh, when you use it. And uh, that conclusion derived from a lot of experiments. Uh, here's one of the uh, early ones. Um, uh, for the, let me describe a little bit how the, uh, uh, the experiment was done. You can't bring someone in the lab and tell them we're going to test your self-control because then people get all weird. Uh, so uh, what yeah, it's often necessary to do in our experiments is tell them we're studying one thing and actually study something else. So we told them we're studying how well they can remember certain tastes. Um, and so it was important that they not eat anything for three hours prior to the experiment. So anyway, the person comes to experiment and they've skipped lunch or whatever, and they're a little bit hungry. Uh, and I guess the next part was kind of mean. We uh, set up a microwave oven in the laboratory and baked chocolate chip cookies. You know how it blows out the uh, aroma. Uh, so the laboratory just smelled so wonderful. We knew it was good because we got lots of complaints from uh, people across the, you know, across the hallway in the office building saying, I'm trying to do my statistics here and I'm smelling your cookies all day. So it was very tempting. Anyway, the person comes in, it's hungry, skipped lunch, uh, smells this delicious aroma of freshly baked uh, pastries, uh, and then we sit them at a, at a table and there's a tray full of these things all looking nice and appealing. In case they weren't into cookies, there are also some chocolates and a nice tasteful arrangement. And also on the table there's a bowl of radishes. And uh, by random assignment, sometimes experiment says, well, you've been assigned to the radish condition. Uh, so your task is going to be to eat the, some radishes and taste them, and don't touch the chocolates. They're for other people. Um, and in, we compared them with people who were told, go ahead and eat the chocolates and cookies, uh, and in another group with no food, because you always want to see if there's something special about food. But the ones we're interested in are the ones who had to sit there wanting those chocolates and seeing those chocolates and smelling those chocolates and had to resist that uh, and make themselves eat those stupid radishes instead. Uh, so then we, uh, uh, you know, of course, we didn't, uh, we, uh, we didn't trust them, but we, we observed them through a, secretly through a little hidden window, uh, and they were tempted, all right, but, uh, uh, but they managed to, uh, you know, some close calls, and people were sniffing them and putting them back, but, uh, but, uh, but nobody bit into the forbidden food, and everybody managed to eat at least uh, half of a radish. Um, so, uh, then we took them to a different room where uh, there's no food or anything uh, and borrowed this procedure from stress research where we see how long do people work at a task before they give up. Because that's a, a test of self-control. Obviously, it has nothing to do with eating radishes, but it's another uh, uh, thing that requires willpower because it's frustrating, you're not getting anywhere, and, and how long do you keep going uh, before uh, you give up and say, I just can't do it. And uh, so the time till they gave up, that was the measure. The puzzles were actually unsolvable, so... Uh, yeah, uh, so how long they, uh, they'll get it. And you see, resisting that temptation, using up their willpower uh, to uh, uh, not eat the, uh, the chocolates and cookies, that took something out of them so that they didn't have that anymore to help themselves keep working and keep trying and keep uh, persevering uh, at the task. All right, uh, we went back actually to the, uh, the Beeper study, uh, which was done some years later, and said, well, does this happen in regular life too? Uh, uh, so we looked at if people had already resisted temptations, uh, resisted desires during that day, how well did they do resisting the next desire that came along? 
Uh, well, the, if you look at the blue line on top, uh, well, if they weren't resisting it, it didn't make any difference. They enacted it right at the same at about that 70% rate. Uh, but as you see the red line, that goes up. The more they resisted other temptations as the day wear on, the weaker their self-control got. So yes, this is something that accumulates over the course of the day. As you use your self-control for one thing as after another, uh, it becomes weaker and you become more prone to fail. You're more likely to give in uh, and uh, eat the chocolate or uh, say the nasty thing that you are inclined to or, or whatever uh, you might later wish you had not done. Um, of course, we all want to be cited in the scientific literature, but the real goal of every scientist is to be cited in the cartoons. Uh, so here's one, uh, got it, uh, implying the idea, willpower is depleted and uh, uh, it affects uh, making decisions. Uh, and uh, well, Dilbert seems to uh, have liked the point. Um, so, to understand uh, self-control, it works like a muscle. That's what we found, what I've explained so far, is like a muscle getting tired. When you use that muscle uh, to resist one temptation, then it gets tired, and so then the next one, it's not quite as strong, and so on, and as the day wears on, it's more likely to fail. Um, there are two other things that are like a muscle. One is your willpower is not gone. We initially thought, oh, maybe the person's used up all the brain fuel or something like that and can't do it anymore. No, they can do it if there's a good enough reason. Uh, it's really like when an athlete starts to get t tired and so you just start conserving your strength. You still have power in those muscles. You can still do a lot, but you sort of get a sense that I don't have unlimited energy and your body automatically conserves. And that's the way it is with willpower. Uh, your body will start conserving uh, it after it has expended some. And we also find, uh, meanwhile, that exercise, uh, just like a muscle gets stronger in the short run, when you exercise, you're tired and your muscle is, 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 feels weaker. Uh, but when you exercise regularly over a period of time, uh, it will actually get stronger. And uh, there are about a dozen published studies uh, showing that if people do self-control exercises for a couple weeks, it will improve their self-control. Uh, David's going to come along in a few minutes and talk about meditation. Meditation seems to have that effect. You can, you know, one of the many effects of, uh, uh, of meditation is that it strengthens this uh, uh, capacity uh, to control yourself. It uh, increases your willpower. All right, let's move along. A um, uh, number of methods have worked. Uh, we often, uh, when people, if you want to do exercises to improve your willpower, to improve your uh, capacity to regulate your behavior and change. Um, in our studies, we've used fairly arbitrary things, uh, like have people, if they're right-handed, we have them, well, just break the habit. Use your left hand for a variety of things. So we say drinking from a cup, brushing your teeth, opening doors, maybe using a computer mouse, uh, things like that. Just switch and use your left hand. The point is you have to exert self-control because your habit is to reach for the doorknob with your right hand, so you have to override that and use your left hand. People do these exercises for a couple of week, weeks and then they come back in the lab and take tests that have nothing to do with right or left hand, uh, but test their self-control and they're, they've gotten better. Uh, it does seem to improve. The um, uh, important thing is to start small, start with the things that you can do. Uh, the uh, New Year's resolutions often have a bad reputation because people make a whole bunch of New Year's resolutions and then fail at all of them uh, by the end of the month. Well, uh, the thing is most resolutions involve changing yourself, so they all require willpower. So if you have five of them, each time you work on one, you're taking away your capacity to work on any of the others. So no wonder uh, they all fail. What you should do I'm not going to say don't make New Year's resolutions because I do believe in trying to improve. Uh, but uh, what you should do uh, is do them sequentially rather than all at the same time. If you have to make five New Year's resolutions, start and start with the easiest one and do that and actually succeed at it. Uh, and then you can move on to the next one and you'll be a little bit stronger. The old Victorian phrase that certain things build character, well, that uh, is finding echoes in modern, modern data. Y yes, these exercises of self-control do make you stronger uh, person in the old uh, character building sense that the Victorians used the phrase. Um, important to recognize there's one willpower, there's one pot of energy. It's not, some people say, well, I have good self-control for uh, getting my work in on time, but bad self-control for keeping my apartment clean or vice versa. Um, no, that's not right. You, you have one pot of energy. It's the same self-control, but it's limited, so it makes sense. People will apply it to one thing and some people will use it to get their work done on time. Other people will use it to keep their apartment clean. Uh, or other things, but uh, it, it is finite, uh, so people allocate it uh, differently. But still, again, controlling thoughts, feelings, uh, restraining your desires and appetites, and making yourself perform effectively, uh, all these draw on the same source uh, of energy. 
Now, uh, in fact, willpower is used even beyond self-control. Uh, things like uh, decision-making, uh, that uh, people make decisions, that uses up some of the same energy. This was a big extension of the, of, of the work. Uh, likewise, initiative, being active instead of passive, that seems to take uh, some energy and, uh, and so on. So uh, after people have exerted self-control, they'll make uh, different decisions in different ways, probably more shallow and uh, shortcut kind of decisions. Uh, when people are depleted, they've used up some of their willpower, they're more likely to try to avoid making decisions. They, oh, I don't want to decide today. Uh, things like that. Uh, they're less prone to compromise, not just compromising with others, but even compromising in a difficult decision where you have to trade off different variables. Uh, for example, price and quality and so on. That uh, usually a person who's got all your willpower, if you know you want some quality, but you want to save some price too, so you kind of compare them and look for the sweet spot where you get the right value and uh, things that satisfy your needs. But that's difficult, and so when people are depleted, uh, what they'll do is fall back on just give me the cheapest or give me the best, uh, but not really trade them off. When there's a default option, people will take that. Uh, they're more uh, self-indulgent in their decisions. Uh, irrational biases can creep in uh, as, as well. I should also say when people are depleted or their self-control is down, uh, their intellectual performance deteriorates. Their logical reasoning is worse. People are giving people IQ tests after they've exerted self-control, uh, like after the radish uh, manipulation or whatever, and they actually do worse uh, on that uh, as well. Uh, this has uh, uh, gotten into the news too. Uh, there's a picture of our American president. He's looking very dapper in his gray suit. Well, it turns out he only wears gray suits, as he uh, acknowledged in, a, in an interview. Uh, he or presumably someone on his staff read the New York Times coverage of our work and, and said, aha, well, you know, the president has all these decisions to make, and very few of them easy ones, because the easy ones get done below him. Um, so uh, he says, well, I'm gonna, I don't want to waste any of my willpower uh, deciding what to wear or what to eat, you know, just put on the same uh, gray suit every day. Uh, there was a blogger who explained this in more vivid terms, uh, but uh, I, uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> those of you familiar with American politics understand this is a, this is a problem we have, but. Um, uh, anyway, um, we also looked at people who have personalities that have good self-control. Uh, now, one obvious thing, if you have good self-control, you should be resisting desires more. So in that Beeper study that we looked, did indeed the people who have scored higher on self-control, did they resist desires more? And no, it was statistically significant in the opposite direction. Uh, they were less likely to do it. Well, that kind of stumped us. Uh, how can that be? They also felt less guilty. Well, what it seemed to be is that they are making choices so they don't get themselves into those temptation situations. Uh, in the book, we call this playing offense rather than playing defense. You don't wait for the problem to arise and bail yourself out. Rather, uh, you set yourself up, uh, you set your life up so that you're not put in these difficult situations, not tempted to do things that will cause uh, problems and stress later. Or to put this more pictorially, I mean, here's one of the classic uh, images in Western civilization of, of self-control. There's uh, Ulysses or Odysseus, depending on whether you're Greek or Roman, on the ship coming home from the siege of Troy. And you know the story of the sirens. They sing this beautiful music, and the sailors wanted to hear it, so they steered close uh, to, uh, the, to shore to try to hear it better and crash on the rocks, and they sink. Uh, the ship sinks and they all die. Well, Ulysses wants to hear the songs, uh, so, but he doesn't want to uh, crash the ship and die. So he has some very pre-commitment devices. You notice he's tied to the mast there. Uh, I don't know why dressing up in women's clothes is apparently supposed to help. Uh, the the rowing, rowers all have their ears blocked up with, so they can't hear the music. Uh, but the thing is, people with good self-control took a different route home. Uh, that uh, instead of you know, using your willpower on the deck to fight this temptation, uh, they just avoided the problem altogether. And that seems to be what people do. Um, all right, uh, I gotta uh, get going here. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, what we know about willpower in the brain, um, it's uh, you know, the brain evolved basically back to front. Uh, the back is the more the older wanting part and the control parts are more in the front. Uh, but also, uh, it's tied into a glucose, uh, which is a chemical in the blood bloodstream uh, that carries energy to your muscles and organs and to your brain too. So glucose is like brain f fuel. And it, although the term uh, you know, has some meaning to sugar, it's not just from sugar, it's from uh, anything that you eat that has uh, nutrients in it. Um, so we find that uh, when people have low uh, self-control, 
uh, or have low glucose rather, their self-control is impaired and they do worse. Uh, glucose is used for, again, it's the body's energy supply. So all these other things will go on will affect your self-control. Physical exertion, you're tired after that. Well, uh, you're more likely to yield a temptation then because it's the same energy you used up in the physical exercise that you would need uh, for uh, self-control and for decision-making. Likewise, the immune system, when you're fighting an illness, you're more prone to make bad decisions uh, and uh, to have lapses in self-control because your body is pulling off uh, a lot of the uh, energy uh, to uh, fight the disease. At other times, the immune system doesn't need much, but when you're exposed to a, a cold or illness or something, then your body really wants all its energy. So I used to make myself keep working uh, whenever I got sick, because you know, I'm just sitting at a computer, I'm not out uh, carrying heavy rocks in the hot sun. But no, it turns out the best thing to do is just, when you start to get sick, just go to bed and try to sleep for 36 hours, <laughs> let your immune system do its work, uh, and then get up and, uh, and be better. Uh, premenstrual syndrome also uh, uses a lot of glucose there, but uh, I don't have time to go into that today. Uh, I did want to <laughs> talk about uh, on the glucose, so this will uh, um, make the point uh, very nicely. This, this is not my study, this is one of these things I wish I'd thought of, but uh, some colleagues that did got all the parole re uh, re judge uh, decisions for uh, a couple years. Uh, in, in Israel, uh, and they went through them, um, mostly requests for parole, uh, or, you know, no parole. It's uh, somebody's been in prison, uh, thinks he's uh, reformed and has behaved well and wants to get let out uh, early uh, to go back in society. The judge has to decide, is this person really better? Uh, obviously, the judge really looks bad if you let the guy out and he goes and commits another crime. So the easy thing for the judge to do is just to say, no, send them all back to prison. But you know, some of these guys really have reformed and really, really deserve it. Well, they looked at the, uh, the, what happens over the course of the day, and you know, each judge may make uh, several dozen uh, uh, decisions. Uh, and uh, they looked at the rate uh, at which, uh, over each day, uh, the, the judge said yes or no. And it, you know, in, in principle, it should be linear, it should be the same uh, decision frequency uh, no matter what time of the day, the first or the last. But it looks, uh, the general downward trend is that uh, as the day wears on and the judge's willpower gets used up, then he's more likely to just go with the easy decision of throw the guy back in the slammer, uh, whereas the early ones have a much better chance of being released. Now there are two up ticks there. Uh, right about 10.30 in the morning, the judges get a break and they get a snack, a banana and a sandwich or something like that. And so the guys who come up right after that, they're lucky. They get a, uh, they're more likely for the, to get paroled again. And then it goes down further. Uh, you know, if you come up uh, for parole just before lunch, it's uh, under 20% your chances of being released. Uh, whereas the one right after lunch, uh, it goes way up again uh, to uh, uh, over half. So if you're ever, uh, I hope this never happens to you, but if you're in prison, then come <laughs> up before the parole judge and they say, well, we can take one more before lunch. Would you like to go say no? <laughs> uh, you really want the judge's glucose to be all replenished uh, when he hears your case. All right, um, last couple things now, in terms of what uh, depletion feels like. Uh, well, this is uh, London Times uh, came up with this picture. I'm not sure this is exactly the idea. She is holding an apple there, which is not usually the first thing people notice in this photo. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, anyway, given the importance of knowing when your willpower is down, it's important to be able to spot the signs in yourself. Unfortunately, there are not very many signs. There some, doesn't seem to be any strong signature feeling. And uh, some other people have gone through all this, the, the published studies on this, which now there are a couple hundred. Yes, behavior changes very much when people are depleted. They do yield to temptation, they're more aggressive, they eat more, spend more money, all these things. Uh, but there's no feeling when they combine all the results of how do you feel and so on. Uh, if anything, tiny effects that you would, you would never notice and, and mostly nothing. So depletion doesn't feel like anything. However, uh, uh, we have one uh, series of studies that we found over and over again in which people seem to feel everything more strongly. Uh, that, so one sign that your willpower is depleted as things start to uh, hit you more strongly. Uh, you know, people in our lab have even started using this as sort of advance warning when you're starting to get sick, if things bother you and upset you more than they should. Uh, that's sort of a sign that you don't have enough glucose to manage your emotions, probably because your immune system is cranking up to fight the disease. And so before you know you're getting sick, uh, your body's already working to fight this, uh, and it's taking away the energy for, uh, uh, that you would otherwise use for self-control, and things hit you uh, harder. 
so in a sense, being depleted turns up the volume on life. And that, that's unfortunately the best nature has given us in terms of a subjective sign to know that our willpower is depleted uh, and we're vulnerable to making bad decisions or yielding to temptation or doing things we'll be sorry about in the long run. Our top-down control of our own behavior uh, is somewhat uh, compromised. So, uh, putting this uh, in the, the, the last minute here, uh, how to put this to, uh, to work, you can get more out of yourself uh, if you understand how uh, willpower works. First of all, yes, it gets depleted, but you still have plenty. The body has uh, great extensive stores of glucose. Its natural inclination is to conserve them. We grew up, or we evolved, we grew up. We evolved in times when uh, there might be no food for uh, days at a time. Uh, and so the body is very protective of its energy. Um, but the tank is not empty and in, in modern civilization. You do still have willpower. Your body may be hesitating to use it, but it is there. Uh, there are mental tricks you can get yourself to do it. Uh, being in a position of uh, power, reminding yourself of your responsibility, uh, getting yourself to believe, even just reminding yourself that you have a lot more willpower uh, than you might think that you do, uh, that can enable you to continue performing well. Uh, even when you have already expended a fair amount of energy. Uh, you understand how to restore and recover from uh, depletion. Uh, we find uh, positive emotion and meditation and some things make people perform better. Uh, of course, the real thing is to replenish the glucose, so uh, uh, getting a meal uh, also uh, is not as much evidence, but sleep seems to help uh, significantly. Uh, so when they used to say, well, let's not face this decision now, we'll try it in the morning, I just think, why, it's the same problem, you just will postpone it till morning, you're not getting anywhere. But uh, on the contrary, if you get a good night's sleep and get some food in you, your body, uh, your, your own batteries are recharged uh, and your, your uh, willpower capacity is uh, restored. People uh, get up in the morning, you know, they don't, uh, uh, they're, they're in good shape. In good shape. Um, also, Use your willpower to establish habits to guide yourself. Don't use what they call the whack-a-mole strategy. I guess there's a game that plays where the, the mole pops up and you whack it down. Don't use it just to respond to crises. Uh, use it to set up your life in a proactive way so that it will run, uh, run smoothly. Uh, stay out of trouble. Avoid the temptations rather than uh, resisting them. Willpower can be increased by exercise, so set yourself little challenges and do them. Find small ways to improve yourself, even things just like start making your bed every day. These changes not only produce their own benefits, but also improve your capacity to change yourself and control yourself. And then ultimately understand when you're vulnerable, what sort of things happen, how these things go, understand how mind and body are related. In this way, indeed, uh, you can make use uh, of uh, this great capacity, uh, which I think uh, does have a fair claim to be the greatest human strength. Thank you very much.